Good morning, evening. Do I look lost? I'm lost. Okay, been one of those days. Some days are like that, even in Australia, and we're not even close. If you don't know how to fill that in, you don't know the book. And I'm not going to tell you what book. You'll have to ask someone else what book. But it has to do with the terrible, horrible, no good day. Uh, and I'm not going to tell you any more, although I probably will. Good to see you tonight. We are glad that you're with us. Um, if you're with us, I'll be with you in a moment. The uh, activities of the spring and uh, timing of various people events and movements and time away and things sometimes overlap and um, that's happening right now, but we're looking forward to having our meeting in a couple of weeks. Hopefully you will be here as Brother Tom Holland uh, is preparing his time for us right now, and we're looking forward to that beginning not this coming Sunday, um, and uh, not the one following, but the one after that. And we're looking forward to a great week with Brother Holland. Um, You probably are not aware, and will be announced later, but I'll give you another heads up, that Tommy Gibbs' mother passed away on Tuesday. Her funeral will be Saturday at Laughlin Funeral Home at 10 o'clock in the morning. The visitation will be from 5 to 7. I'll have to check my notes now. Uh, on Friday evening um, at Laughlin. And uh, we do regret that very much. Let's begin in prayer, and then we'll do our study for the night. Our Heavenly Father, we're grateful for the day. We're thankful for each and every blessing of life. We're thankful for your gifts to us. We thank you for the opportunity to be together tonight, here in this place, studying from the scriptures that you've given us. Father, we pray that you will help us to gather from the words that you've given us of life, wisdom, and for those thoughts to become a part of our hearts and our lives as we share together the grace of life. Father, we're thankful for the church at Maysville. We're thankful for your church the world over in every place where your children call upon your name. Father, we ask your blessings on our elders, on each and every member, on each of our families. Father, we ask your continued blessings to be with those of our number who have special needs. We ask that you will bless the Gibb family and in their loss and be with them. Father, we ask your continued blessings to be with Tom Horn and that he will continue to improve and soon be back in our midst. We thank you for watching over him. We ask your continued blessing to be with Brother Lois Webster, that you'll provide for him. Father, we ask that you will um, continue to help Alan Edson in his recovery, uh, in the challenges that he faces. We pray that his injuries will soon be healed and, and he'll be able to uh, be doing the things that he wants to be doing. Father, others are around us who have ongoing challenges with their health and issues around them that that make life difficult, we ask that you'll help each of us as we are able to provide comfort to one another that we do that. We know, Father, that we're comforted from you. Father, go with us through this night. We pray that you will help us as we make our preparations for the gospel meeting. We ask that Brother Holland's work with us will be of great benefit and the word that he will speak will fall on good hearts. Father, go with us through this night and forgive us of our sins. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Our time tonight will be spent in predominantly the middle of 1 Timothy chapter 6. We started last week and I told you I wanted to come back and touch on the word in verse 11 where we left off right as the bell was ringing. Incessantly ringing, I might add. Uh, 
First Timothy chapter 6, verse 11. But you, O man of God, flee these things and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, gentleness. Flee these things. Paul uses the word flee four times as he addresses his letters. Um, and I would like to look at each of those because there's a, a, an import to it. One will only give a glancing blow to. The first one, not in sequence, but in uh, the, my choice of using them, is in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 22, where the discussion simply says, as he begins what we have in this verse, flee also youthful lusts, but pursue righteousness, faith, love, peace with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. A very similar verse uh, to what we're actually reading now in verse 11. Flee one thing, pursue something else. And the fleeing here, um, youthful lusts. What are youthful lusts? As Paul is describing this concept, uh, we would answer that uh, those things that are um, common or peculiar to those who are young. And I think that it probably would not take a great deal of effort for us to recognize that once identified in that concept, our lusts do fall into some categories. That uh, the things that you perhaps longed for when you were young may not be the things that you lust for after you're older. And there are troubles and, and trials that affect our young people that, uh, that simply are not a part of us uh, later on. If Paul was addressing, perhaps we should have a discussion of, of, uh, of those lusts that affect us as we mature. Uh, the things that we long for and desire at various stages along our way. And uh, we certainly could have uh, things included in that. The second reference that I want to note is in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Verse 18, and here Paul is uh, addressing, and if you're reading from uh, other than the New King James Version, uh, your text will say differently, uh, probably because of the translation there, but it may not. New King James says, flee sexual immorality. And then Paul goes on to add, every sin that a man does is outside the body, but he who commits sexual immorality sins against his own body. And then more follow-up concerning that. Paul is addressing some issues in 1 Corinthians that uh, were particularly needful for that church. The issue in chapter 6, or an issue, is the subject of sexual impurity. The word that is translated there, sexual impurity or sexual immorality, is the Greek word pornea, from which we get our word pornography. The Greek word actually is a, um, is a broad term. It is the broadest of the sexually immoral acts. Pornea describes any and all areas of sexual impurity. Fornication is the word that is translated uh, from, or the, is, is the translation of, uh, of pornea in the King James Version and others. Fornication itself sometimes needs a translation, uh, what that means. Some have suggested that, that fornication is sexual sin of single individuals, while adultery is a sexual sin of married individuals. Well, that's partially correct. The word that is translated adultery, which comes to us from the Greek word makea, does have in mind the idea of a covenant barrier or a covenant bond breaking. That is, you are bound to another individual and you have become sexually impure because you have broken a covenant to that person. And it is the, the, a covenant issue uh, that's involved in the idea of adultery. You cannot commit adultery um, unless there is some aspect of a covenant relationship. Hence, 
the term being used in the Old Testament where God accuses Israel of committing adultery. Well, what, how did they commit adultery against God? Uh, certainly not in the literal sexual sense, but God accuses Israel, his, his wife, that God was married to these people, that this was his family. And so when they are unfaithful to God, God says, you have committed adultery. You have become involved with other gods. Likewise, in the New Testament, we can have the concept of uh, adultery being both literal, that is, a person involved sexually with another, and figurative, that you have violated uh, your bonds. And of course, uh, that can apply. Pornea, though, is a broader term that means anything sexual. So, adultery is included in pornea. Bestiality is included in pornea. Homosexuality is included in pornea. If we're talking about children who are involved in premarital sexual activity, it is included in pornea. Everything that is sexually immoral is, in, is, is included in this term. So when Paul says, flee from this, everything that is sexually impure would be included in what Paul told Timothy to run away from, and here to the Corinthians also uh, to run away from uh, this. If you watch television, maybe I should rephrase that. If you surf through the channels on a television and you have access to cable, you're going to run across some um, very interesting things on the television. Many, many of the shows, if they are not inherently encouraging sexual immorality, they are tacitly doing so. Many of the shows on television are designed to provoke thoughts regarding human sexuality. And we are surrounded by it. Internet pornography is a $97 billion a year industry. It's hard to put that number into perspective. Uh, you could take about the top um, 30 technology stocks and uh, Microsoft and Google and half a dozen others they wouldn't come close to that in annual earnings. Um, I found a statistic that uh, was, was very interesting going back um, even a number of years. Uh, for the years 1905 and 19, excuse me, <laughs> not 1905. I caught you. I'm trying to see if you're awake. 2005 and 2006, um, Pornography was estimated to have grossed $2.6 billion and $3.3 billion per year in those years uh, annually. That's more than the combined income of ABC, NBC, and CBS together. That doesn't include what's free. It's a huge problem. And it involves more than um, we're going to discuss tonight. It is both a cause and the identification of uh, a, a major issue in the United States of America and worldwide. That's pornea. Flee. The third time Paul uses this term that we're going to identify is in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 14, where Paul says simply to flee idolatry. Idolatry, most of you are going to say, i got no problem with idolatry. Um, and you'd go on about your business. Until I might point you toward Colossians chapter 3, verse 5, where Paul says, And covetousness, which is idolatry. We may not be bowing down before a Buddha, but many in the United States bow down before material things. And Paul said, those of us who are involved in covetousness, we are guilty of idolatry. We are worshiping 
things. And that's a problem. Flee those. And then finally, Paul's discussion here, which leads us back to our text where we began. Uh, flee these things. What things? Well, Paul certainly has in mind what the discussion here is that we're talking about, and that is material things. Verse 6, godliness with contentment is great gain. We brought nothing into this world. It's certain we can carry nothing out. Having food and clothing, with these we shall be content. With those who, but those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and harmful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil, for which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness and pierce themselves through with many sorrows. But you, O oh man of God, flee these things. Certainly Paul is identifying there the concept of the, uh, the physical world that Timothy could get caught up in and what he's involved with. And we come to the word flee. All right, Paul said flee these things and flee others. What does the word flee mean? Well, run away. That's right. Good translation. Run away. There are some things that can be faced head on. You stand toe to toe and you battle them. Other things, you don't. You run away. I have seen some electricians handle fairly uh, large voltages and work power lines hot. That is, they're energized. But you know what? Every year in the United States of America, certified journeyman electricians get electrocuted and die. Working on residential and commercial applications. They are trained, they are knowledgeable, they understand the risks, they know what they're doing, and they get killed. Why? Because if you're working a power line hot, it just takes one minor mistake, and you're toast. Fornication is not something that we can stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with and battle without losing. Timothy was told to flee from the material things. We cannot stand toe to toe with covetousness and expect to come out on top. You're going to, that'll bite you. The material things of this world, the sexual lusts of this world, these things are powerful. And if you don't understand that power, then all we have to do is just go back into the Old Testament and start talking about David, one of the most highly discussed individuals of the Old Testament. And we know that David was involved with Bathsheba. Solomon, who was described as the wisest man of the Old Testament, who but God gave great uh, wisdom to. What took Solomon out? Women. 1 Kings chapter 11, his wives turned him against God, both, uh, I guess, beginning sexually and then uh, into idolatry. Uh, the discussion that he has with his son in Proverbs regarding these things, very graphic. Run away. There are things we simply need to run from. Flee. Stay away. Put distance between yourself and these objects. And uh, that is how you deal with certain problems. Joseph's response to Potiphar's wife was perfect. He left his clothes in her grasp and he ran away. Conversation is not going to fix that kind of a problem. But if you're going to run away from something, is there something else that you're going to run toward? Run away from this, flee. What about pursue? That's Paul's next word. And pursue, and then we have a list. Righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, gentleness. The, word, the root word that is translated pursue is the same word that is translated persecution. 
in the New Testament. Now, those may seem very different at first, but when you do a, root, a word study on them, they actually are quite the same. Uh, even in our own English language, pursue, persecution. Write those down in English and notice how much similar, similarity there is. The root term literally means to chase after. Persecution is the chasing after people. Uh, those who were persecuted. That's what Paul was doing in Acts chapter 9 when he is persecuting Christians. He is on his way to Damascus. He is chasing them, literally. Well, Paul says to pursue, to, to grab onto these things, to, to run them down. And uh, what, is we, what are we going to chase down and run down? Well, first, righteousness. Righteousness. Dikaiosune. One, uh, one of the statements that Paul makes in the book of Ephesians chapter 6 when he begins to talk about the, the Christian armor is the breastplate. And I know that many of you have talked about armor in the past. If you're going to protect a, a soldier in battle, you've got to take care of the vital organs. Even today, in uh, modern warfare, our police officers uh, who uh, go out onto the streets, they wear a vest uh, that protects them, their chest, their uh, internal organs. They may not call it a breastplate, but that's what it is. Now, it also involves uh, protection for their sides and back. Um, there are then often called what's identified as a trauma plate, a, a, a special product that's put in front to stop a, uh, uh, a weapon of various kinds. Well, going back a long, long way, it was recognized that the human body is very vulnerable to damage right here. And if you're going to take care of your heart, your lungs, and your uh, organs inside here, inside your rib cage, you need something to help out. Well, that breastplate is there, the breastplate of Ephesians 6, 14, righteousness. What covers us? What, what holds this in and protects us? Our heart, our life. Breastplate of righteousness. Pursue righteousness. The word comes from a similar term that describes the justification or the process of going from an outside of God's uh, graciousness to an inside. Justified is a very close cousin to this. Pursue it. If you understand your relationship with God, chase after that. Second, godliness. The concept of godliness and that idea, um, Paul used it several times. Look in verse 3. If anyone teaches otherwise, 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 3. If anyone teaches otherwise and does not consent to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which accords with godliness verse 6 now godliness with contentment is great gain verse 11 pursue godliness what is it that uh, that paul has in mind here verse 5 i left out Useless wranglings of men of corrupt minds and destitute of the truth who suppose that godliness is a means of gain. From such withdraw yourself. Three positives, one negative. Paul said, this is good. Go after those things which are like God. Others believe that being like God can be used uh, to their own advantage. When you think of yourself, two terms that ought to be able to be described of any faithful Christian is righteous and godly. Right? Third, pursue faith. We could spend the night on any one of these topics, and of course we have done a great discussion at various times on the topic of faith. Faith is both an action and a goal. Hebrews chapter 11 verse 6, you can quote as good as I can, that without Faith, 
It is impossible to please God. What must we have in order to come to God? Faith. What was it that people were going to have when they heard the message of the Christ? They were going to, if they came to understand God, have faith. That is both a trust, a belief, an act, um, and a pursuit of that that they believed. It's not just belief alone, but rather the, the choice of acting in that way. Four, love. If we went only to 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 13, where Paul would say, Now these three abide. Faith, hope, and love. And what's most important? Is faith or hope more important? I'm not sure that I can parse that one. Uh, we're talking about our hope and expectation of being with God and our faith, our trust and, and, and belief in God, and our, our desire to serve God. Uh, but Paul throws a third category in there. And while we're discussing the, the relative value of faith and hope, which surely as Christians we could have quite a, a debate over, Paul throws in a third category and says, this one trumps those completely. And this one catches us by surprise. Faith, hope, and love. And then he says, and the greatest of these is love. Think about that for a moment. Really think about that for a moment. Because while we're sitting in worship or Bible class or some other setting where we're particularly attuned to spiritual things, there may be lots of spiritual thoughts that we have. And we think about our, our determination to serve God and our faithfulness and our worship and things of this sort and things, those things that are important and the things that we would fight over and, and have conflict over in regard to what is true and holy. And yet in this category where Paul includes these three things, our hope, our faith, and love, he says, love is more important than the other two. Now, that's not to diminish hope or faith. We quoted from Hebrews eleven six 6 just a moment ago. We said, it is impossible, impossible to please God without faith. How could anything be more important than what is required in order to please God? Well, love. And Paul spends some time in 1 Corinthians chapter 13 in the earlier verses. And, and describe exactly how important that quality is. If he has all wisdom, gives his body to be burned, has faith so that he could remove mountains, he is, he is filled with miraculous powers. But he says, I don't have love. Then I'm worthless. I'm becoming noise. I am of no value. That's the significance of of love in life. Pursue love. Patience. The word that is translated patience here um, could also be translated by another, several other words, but it means literally to stay under a load. Now, that may not have a lot of impact until you begin to explain what that means. The literal concept of the Greek word means to bear up under a load and not try to get out from under it. It is translated endurance or sometimes patience. But it means I don't quit. I get loaded up, I have a burden, and I don't quit. I have problems and I have difficulties, and I don't quit. What Paul would describe in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, and he would say, we are, we are beaten, we are bruised, we are crushed, we are uh, persecuted, but we haven't quit. We haven't stopped going. We continue to hold on. The last in the category that Paul lists here is gentleness. Now, there's a neglected word, gentleness. It is part of the clothing of the elect. Paul describes in Colossians chapter 3, verse 12. After we describe those things to put off, he says, we put on gentleness. 
In Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 2, where Paul is describing the unity of the body, do not fracture the body, but rather maintain the unity, unity of the Spirit. Then he goes on and talks about, for there's one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who's above all and through all and in you all. But you know what he says in verse four, uh, verse 2 of that text in Ephesians chapter 4? What keeps the body together? A spirit of gentleness. Not of fighting, not of conflict. The body's brought together by those gentle spirits. Galatians chapter 6, verse 1. When Paul talks about how brethren ought to respond to a brother or sister who is caught up in sin, it is with gentleness. Pursue these things. Flee from those, pursue these. Verse 12. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life to which you were also called and have confessed the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. I'm not sure I'm going to get to all of those concepts. We'll start out and see what we can do. Fight the good fight of faith. Let's go and do a little reading uh, from some other places for just a moment. Let's go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 9 to start with. Chances are you don't like fighting. There are a few people who do. They do. They like fighting. They enjoy conflict. They really get a kick out of uh, getting in the, the figurative ring with someone and either, either verbally or emotionally uh, jousting with them. But that's not, um, that's not the norm. How do you think of your life? Most of us don't want to think of our lives as being filled with fighting, and yet the Christian life, to some degree, is a fight. Verse 24, Do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may obtain it. The Christian race is designed, or the Christian life is designed, uh, or described as a race. Paul uses that phrase again in 2 Timothy chapter 4 when he says, I've completed my course. I've, I've done the race. Verse 25, Everyone who competes for the prize is tempered in all things. They do it to obtain a perishable crown, but we for an imperishable crown. Therefore I run thus, not with uncertainty, thus I fight. Not as one who beats the air. We are pursuing a crown, not a, not a crown of, of floral arrangements like the, uh, the Greeks pursued uh, in the games. That's what they were awarded. We're not pursuing the garlands. We are pursuing something else. The crown that will be given to us is a crown much more significant than that. It is an imperishable crown. And Paul says, for that, I'm willing to fight. And Timothy would too. A little farther forward, Philippians chapter 3. We could read lots of Paul's comments in uh, Philippians chapter 3 and describe um, his pursuit of these things. Dropping back all the way to verse 7, uh, he has almost an unbroken discussion of the things that he has given up. But pick up with me in verse 12. Not that I have already attained or am already perfected, but I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. There's a, this is a pursuit. There is a drive here that Paul is after that simply doesn't... Um, it doesn't factor in in the normal course of life of just going uh, through the motions. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 18. This charge I commit to you, son Timothy, according to the prophecies previously made concerning you, that by them you may wage the good warfare. And I've already made reference to Paul's statement in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 7. I have fought the good warfare fight 
It's a conflict we're in. Every day. Sometimes we see it, sometimes we don't. Sometimes we lose the conflict. We find ourselves involved in life and, and uh, a temptation will come up upon us and we'll allow our guard to get down and we don't remember that we're in a fight and wham, we get slammed. And we fall and pray to some temptation. Because we forgot. Just like those electricians I was talking to you about a while ago. Although they know the electricity is there, and although they have the training, and if anybody was standing there right by them and say, what would electricity do to you if you grabbed a hold of it and took a ground right here? So, well, it'd kill you dead. It would, and they could describe stopping your heart and charring of your flesh and burning of your nerves and all of the other things that go along there. Well, then why would they ever allow themselves to get electrocuted? Because you can lose your focus. And you can forget what you're doing. I am loathe somewhat to provide bad illustrations of flying. And a couple of folks in here have told me no more flying disasters. I've mentioned to you before, having watched a lady who did a wing walking routine Libby and I saw her perform at Sun and Fun several years ago. We saw her perform again in Oshkosh. I've seen her since three or four times. She is no longer with us among the living. She was on an airplane, actually on the bottom side of an airplane, where she was doing a routine they had done many times. And the pilot who was flying the airplane, was very skilled in what he was doing, and for some reason, unexplainable to anyone except him in that cockpit. He made an error in how he was controlling the aircraft and flew it directly into the ground. It's almost certainly an accident. But there is a requirement when you're doing certain things where there's a great proximity to danger that you not lose your focus. It's hard to maintain that focus all the time. If people were shooting bullets at you right now, you would be ducking. We're not ducking because we don't see the bullets. But we're in a fight and the bullets are flying and the casualties are mounting. And people around us, friends, family, neighbors, are getting hit by temptations that are taking them out of the game. They are losing to the devil and the temptations that the devil springs on them. They have forgotten they're in a fight. And it's a fight. And Satan wants you to die in this fight. And God wants you to live. But if you forget what's going on, it'll get you. And so Paul says, fight the good fight. It's funny how certain words just have a memory of their own. And uh, as I was working through this material and came across this, this word in, in the, uh, the original language, lambano. Wow, I know that doesn't mean anything to you, but it did to me. It was one of the very first lessons that I had in Greek uh, at Fried Hardeman long ago with Brother William Woodson, another soldier who has gone on. Lambano, I take, I hold, I receive. Paul says, take hold of eternal life. Take hold of eternal life. How do you grab on to, how do you take hold of eternal life? Well, I don't know. Do you hold on to your, to your wallet, to your pocketbook? Yeah, I got it. Well, how do, you, how do you keep up with it? Well, it's important to me. I stick it in my pocket. I carry it with me wherever I go. Have you ever forgotten it? Well, you may have. You lost it? Oh, if you lost it and you knew you lost it, you immediately did nothing else until you found it. Take hold of eternal life. Grab on.
Mark. What you're going to take hold of is eternal life. 26 times in the New Testament that phrase is used. We don't have time to go to read all of them. In Romans chapter 6 verse 23, Paul said the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. What an interesting phrase. That becomes particularly important to you if you have personally experienced the loss of a loved one. Until you have had a close family or very good friend or someone else who is extremely close to you pass from this life, your view of life and death is not the same. Once you have that experience, you're recalibrated. You think of things in a different way. The concept then of eternal life has a very great and changed meaning, at least for many. I want to read from Mark chapter 10, beginning <clears throat> in um, verse 28. Then Peter began to say to him, See, we have left all and followed you. So Jesus answered and said, Assuredly, I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or lands for my sake and the gospels who shall not receive a hundredfold now in this time houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions and in the age to come eternal life. How could you lose your mother and get another mother? There have been many who've left their mother and become a part of a church family and found they have many mothers. There have been some who've left brothers and sisters and come into the church to find out they have many other brothers and sisters. In fact, we spoke Sunday of the Lord's own comments in Luke chapter 8 where he says, my brothers and my sisters, my family, my mother are those who hear the word of God and are obedient. And so you may leave behind a physical family, but you gain a huge family in this world and in the next eternal life. If we had marked in some way around us the concept of, uh, of eternal life so that it was emblazoned on our heart every day, it would change the temptations of many of the things uh, that we face. I am not going to have time to finish uh, our discussion here in uh, this verse. So I'm going to pick up next week, Lord willing, I'm going to come back to that. No, I won't. I'll be gone. Uh, when we come back to this, we'll pick up at that spot where Paul says, uh, to that which you have been called. And I want to take on that phrase because it's important. So let's conclude our thoughts in this by reading from Titus chapter 3, verse 1 and following. Remind them to be subject to rulers and authorities, to obey, to be ready for every good work, to speak evil of no one, to be peaceable, gentle, showing all humility to all men. For we ourselves were also once foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving various lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. But when the kindness and the love of God our Savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to His mercy, He saved us through the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit, whom He poured out on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior, that, having been justified by His grace, we should become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. God's grace came so that we can truly understand 
the idea of an eternal life with him. Thank you for your time and attention. Next time we gather, Lord willing, uh, we'll pick up there in the 12th verse. Um, and Paul's address to what Timothy was called to. Thank you.